So in this video I'm going to talk about kinetic theory and how it applies to gases. So there's a few things you need to be able to do with kinetic theory. The first thing you need to be able to do is derive the equation to calculate the pressure on the side of a uniform cube. Next you need to be able to calculate the mean square speed and the root mean square speed from pressure and volume. We're going to look at some of the assumptions involved in kinetic theory, so following on from the last video where I talked about a couple of them and making sure you're aware of all of the different assumptions that are made. And the last thing we're going to do is prove that the average kinetic energy is directly proportional to temperature. I'm going to finish off this video by going through a few example questions so you can see how these equations are used. So let's get cracking. First of all, deriving an equation to calculate the pressure on a side of a cube. So we've got a cube with side length L, and we have a surface that we're going to be investigating which has area A. And we're going to assume that you have a particle travelling normally to side A, so it's coming in perpendicular, and that it collides elastically, and it starts off travelling at speed U. So looking back at some of the unit 4 stuff on momentum, we know in an elastic collision total kinetic energy is conserved. And that as the wall of the container isn't going to move, that must mean the kinetic energy remains with the gas particle. So going in, it will have momentum mu, because it's travelling at u, and going out it will have momentum minus mu. So the change in momentum is going to be the original momentum minus, minus mu which is 2mu. Um, now the other thing we need to think about is the number of these collisions which are happening per second because that gives us an idea of the force experienced by the wall. So, let's think about how long it will take between collisions with wall A. So if we think we have a particle coming in here, collides with A, it's going to bounce back to the other side and then return to A. So it's going to have travelled the total distance to L. So the time between collisions is going to be the distance, so 2L, divided sorry, by the velocity, which is U. So then we want we can get the rate of change of momentum, which is how we get our force. So the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So, so in this case, that's going to be 2mu divided by 2l L over u, which ends up being just um, u squared over L. So this is a great start. We've got an expression for the force on the container wall. But I said we were looking for pressure. And the other thing that we need to take into account is actually that some of the particles will be travelling at different velocities. So we need to, when we're expanding this to think about the whole area of the cube, we need to take into account the fact they all have different velocities. And we do this using something called the mean square speed. So this is where we are at currently. Now, just so you know what the mean square speed is, it's written like this, and then with a square to show it's the mean square speed. And that's calculated by essentially adding up the squares of a number of different speeds. So it's like adding up the squares of all the different gas molecules. And then you divide by the number of the gas molecules there. So that's how you get this mean square speed. And it's not dissimilar to when we were doing AC where you use RMS values because if taking the average you'd have got zero. It's a very similar thing here. It's, it gives you an idea of the average speed squared of all the particles. And we put that into the equation, so we actually get the force we're going to be encountering 
on the wall, the total force from all of the different particles is going to be calculated a bit like this. So we've included in here the number of the gas particles that are colliding. And obviously we've got our root, uh, sorry, our mean square speed, not our root mean square speed in here. And that doesn't look too like an L. This is still your L on the bottom line. Okay, so let's turn this into pressure. Now we know pressure is force divided by area. So we've got our expression for force. And we need to divide it by L times A. And you will, you will recognize that that is an expression for the volume of the original cube, which is very nice. So then the thing, we're going to rearrange this slightly and take into account of the fact that actually we're dealing with a three-dimensional shape, so we focus just on the pressure on one side of the container. But we actually need to start thinking about, well, um, what would the total pressure be? Okay, so let's quickly look at our diagram. So we've currently found the pressure on this side of our container. So let's say we've looked in the x direction. But we also need to think about the pressure in this direction up here. Let's call that the y. And the pressure going into the page, so in the z direction. So we've just looked at the x direction. So then if we think about, if we want to know what the total mean square speed is, so I'm going to call that this sieva, it's going to be um, your x, whoa, that's just looking untidy, it's going to be your mean square of x, your mean square of y, and your mean square of z. And since we're, we're going to assume all the particles are moving randomly at very similar speeds in those directions, we'll say that this is equivalent to this. And let's use the notation we used above, where we use this u term there. So then that, that's just linking in the previous question. I haven't just made some random substitution there. So we've got this relationship here. So if we want to substitute into our previous equation, one of these is one third of that. So we've just divided three on both sides. So that means we get an expression for our pressure and Let's take volume over to the other side. So we've got PV. We've got the number of molecules, we've got the mass. We've got the mean square speed in all directions. And then we've got that over 3. So you've actually derived an expression for the pressure on a container compared to the mean square speed. And we'll look at linking that to temperature in a second. So that's quite a long step through, so you might need to watch this again to go back and pick some of these things up, but that is the steps of how it is derived. So let's look at the mean square speed and the root mean square speed. So we've looked at how we can calculate the mean square speed, so let's look at how we can what that is and the root mean square speed as well. So mean square speed and the root mean square speed are used to help approximate the motion of the average particle. And this root mean square speed is essentially 
like the average velocity of a gas particle in a gas. So let's quickly look at mean square speed first of all. So we saw this in the previous one. And we think if it's a speed squared, it's going to have units meter squared seconds to the minus two. So if you square root that, and you'll often see that written in this form here, and sometimes called an RMS, and we think, well, that's just going to be the units of speed, seeing as it's the square root of the previous one. And like I said, this is the average, if you like, speed of a gas particle in a substance. Okay, so that's that. So let's move on and have a look at some of the assumptions. So, I looked at a couple of these in the previous video, but here's a few more key things. The first thing you need to assume is your gas contains a large number of particles. That's how the assumptions we made earlier that on average the velocity in each of the x, y, z directions is approximately the same, so that's how we could get the one third into the equation. And this holds almost universally, so um, the more things you have, the more they conform to the mean of them. So if you have a plane filled with 400 people, all planes roughly, give or take, weigh the same amount because it conforms to an average. And if you flip 1,000 coins, you'd expect it to conform to having 500 and 500. The more you do, the more it becomes like the statistical model. And this is exactly the same too. The other thing we are assuming is that the gas particles move rapidly and randomly. They follow Newton's laws, well they're particles, so, and they have mass, so that shouldn't be a shocker. Um, we have collisions are perfectly elastic, so total energy is always conserved. And if it's a collision with a like wall container, that would mean the gas particle keeps all of the kinetic energy. There are no attractive forces between the particles. I mentioned in the previous one that there are going to be some scientists turning over in their grave at that assumption, but it's a useful one to make. We assume the forces act instantly, so it instantly rebounds off of a wall. It's not We're not thinking about it taking time, looking at crumble zones or anything like that. And we're assuming the particles have negligible volume compared to the volume of the container. Essentially, they're incredibly small. Okay, so those are some of the assumptions. And the last thing I'm going to look at before I move on to some examples is actually looking at the relationship between the mean square speed and temperature so then we can look at the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. So let's do that. So remember before we had an ideal gas equation. You should recognize it. PV equals nRT. And in the previous part of this, we've got another expression. We had PV equals one third the number of molecules, and the mass of one of the molecules, and the mean square speed. So, obviously, we've got PV on both. Let's equate them together. So we've got nRT is equal to one third n m c root mean square. So let's have a look at how we can arrange these into a useful form. So we're looking to get towards kinetic energy. So you'll notice here we have some of the makings of kinetic energy. We have m and we have a speed squared. So we need to put a half on to that side and then we can get some of that. So how about this mode multiply both sides by a half and both sides by three because that will clear the third term. So if you multiply by three and then multiply by half we'll end up with three over two and then we'll end up with number of molecules times by half m root mean square speed. So we've got our kinetic energy into the equation now. So let's think about what these symbols represent. So n was the, the number of moles of our substance, of course. And 
then we can think about making a cancellation with this n on the other side. So let's do that. So let's remember when we were doing our equations, we had obviously the equation of state. So we can actually make a substitution here for nr, which remember was all equal to the number of moles, big N in this case, multiplied by the Boltzmann constant. And that's a useful substitution because it allows us to do some cancelling. So let's put that in. So we've got our 3 over 2 still. We've got now we've got n k t is equal to n half m v square. Ooh, got a bit carried away with my kinetic energy there. Let's get that right. OK, so now we can cancel these n's. So we have got the kinetic energy. And because it's using the root mean square speed, this is an average kinetic energy on that side. 3 over 2k, which is constant t. So we've got a constant here, because k and 3 over 2 are constant. So we can clearly see that kinetic energy, or the average kinetic energy, of the gas particles is directly proportional to the temperature, remembering that this temperature is on the absolute scale, so it is measured in Kelvin. And that is a useful relationship in predicting how gases are going to behave, which is quite nice. And you might see this in an alternative form, remembering that K can be substituted for R over the Avogadro constant. So you sometimes see this written in the form like this. So don't be shocked if you see this. They're exactly the same equation. You just substitute in for the Boltzmann constant. So anyway, that's a lot of deriving and equations and all that sort of thing. So let's have a look at some example questions so you can see these in action. Okay, so we've got some helium gas in a container of a certain volume. And you've got the mass of each atom, the number of atoms, and the pressure. So, first of all, let's state our equation we're going to be using. So we're going to be using this equation we derived earlier. And obviously if we want the mean square speed, we need to do a rearrangement. Three PV NM. So let's do some substituting. Once we finish writing out all those numbers, we should end up with this here. And if we give the answer to appropriate numbers, significant figures, we should get 1.6 times 10 to the 5. Remembering the units for mean square speed are meters squared s to the minus 2. So that's what we've got. Okay, so then if we want to calculate the RMS, so obviously we're looking for the root mean square speed. So the square root of this, obviously using your unrounded version in your calculation, and that comes out at 4.0 times 10 to the 2 meters per second. Again, two significant figures because the information you were given was one significant figure. So let's think about it is if we double the temperature what will happen to the RMS speed? Well, we know from before that during our derivation, I don't need to go into the root yet, that the mean square speed is directly proportional to temperature. So that means the square root mean square speed is going to be directly proportional to the square root of temperature, if we square root both sides. So if we double the temperature, that's going to be the same as multiplying the square root of it by root 2. So you would expect the new root mean square squared, 
would be the 1.6 into the 5, which gives you the old mean sin squared multiplied by square root of 2, and that should come out as 5.6 times 10 to 2 meters per second there. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Written out more neatly, for those of you who can't read my handwriting, there you go. I would pause it because I'm now going to end this video.